We beheld the seat of Pelly's dreadful reign. We stood on the edge of a tremendous crater. This was once filled with liquid fire. So wrote the first Westerners known to have visited this great volcanic crater in 1828. Three missionaries who climbed to the top of this mountain, built by the Hawaiian goddess Pele, the goddess of fire. It's one of two volcanoes which gave birth to the island of Maui. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. Hawaiians named this place Haleakala, House of the Sun. Today, it's an awesome relic of the power of volcanoes to build and to destroy, especially here in the Pacific. 10,000 feet above sea level, Haleakala plunges another 19,000 feet into the sea, to the floor of the Pacific Ocean, where it began erupting about a million years ago. After thousands of years, it eventually burst through the ocean surface and continued erupting and building until about 984 AD. There's no written account of Haleakala's last eruption, but scientists estimate it was about 200 years ago. But 100 years later, in 1883, the modern scientific age was dawning. Worldwide communication systems were in place, and there's no doubt about what happened some 7,000 miles south and west of Haleakala across the Pacific. May 1883, a dormant volcano on a remote island in the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra began a series of violent eruptions. It belched out vast clouds of ash that obscured the sun. The explosions were heard 70 miles away. Toward the end of May, the fireworks seemed to have died down a little, though ships passing through the straits at night could see the glow of molten lava in the crater. Large-scale eruptions began again in mid-June. This time, they were even more violent. Earth tremors were felt in many parts of Java and Sumatra. The crater where the explosions had begun was blown away, but now there were at least 10 others belching out steam and pumice dust. It went so high that the ash fell on villages 300 miles away. The climax came on August 27, 1883, with an explosion equal to 3,000 atom bombs. The island of Krakatoa disappeared with a bang that was heard as far away as Sri Lanka and Australia. It was the loudest noise the world had ever known. Amazingly, the actual explosion killed very few people. The havoc was caused by the seismic waves called tsunamis that followed. Some were a hundred feet high.
The tsunamis ripped over low-lying areas, wiping out mainland towns and villages, including this little port of Anya. It's estimated that 36,000 people throughout the area died. Engravings from the time show ships sailing through seas of corpses. This amazing series of photographs taken a few days later on the mainland show scenes reminiscent of Hiroshima. All that remains of a railway and an engine. The giant waves flattened everything, including a hotel and a fort. A Dutch gunboat was struck by a series of 90-foot waves and carried over a mile into the jungle. After the Big Bang, there was one minor explosion and then silence. The dust that rose 50 miles high circled the earth, causing spectacular sunsets for years afterwards. Half the island of Krakatoa had disappeared, much of it into the upper atmosphere. For a hundred miles around, floodwaters wiped the slate clean. Nature could have a fresh start. A century after the floodwaters drained away is an ideal time to see what sort of job nature has done of repairing the damage. The floods flattened huge areas of jungle and destroyed countless villages. As for the wildlife there, only those lucky enough to be isolated on high ground survived. Today, Java, Indonesia is the most populated island in the world. At its northwest tip is an area of jungle where no one now lives, Ujung Kulon, 25 miles from Krakatoa. The reason no one lives there is that Krakatoa's tidal waves wipe them out. They have never returned. Ujung Kulon is a national park now and the last home of the Javan rhino the rarest large animal on Earth. In 100 years, the jungle has returned so completely that the only way to penetrate the park is along one of its few rivers. This one is called the Chaginter. To travel along the Chaginter's narrow five-mile course is like making a voyage back to prehistoric times. When the great tsunamis came bursting over Ujung Kulan in August 1883, some Javan rhino must have been caught above flood level. That a few of their descendants are living there today is due to the human side of the tragedy. The fact that Ujung Kulan has never been resettled since the disaster.
Today, the jungle is so lush that it's hard to believe Ujung Kulan was inundated by waves of salt water 50 feet high. The secret of its complete rehabilitation lies largely in its immense rainfall, over 100 inches a year. are followed by six months of sunshine. In such a climate, almost anything will grow. When the rains end in April, it's an immediate signal for the birds to begin nesting. These are blue-throated bee-eaters. The olive-backed sunbird feeds its young in its complicated hanging nest. A female Philippine glossy starling looks for a nest hole. A pair of brown-capped woodpeckers has already found one, though a little more wood carving is needed. a young red-headed flower pecker. An ashy wood swallow feeds its young after they've left the nest. The yellow-bellied prinia arrives to supply its young and removes a dropping from the nest. That's a gray-cheeked bull bull. The open banks of the little river offer insect-eating birds an abundance of food. The mud flats of the Chigenta River are home to thousands of fiddler crabs and a hunting ground for those who find crab a delicacy. The waving of the one big claw is territorial behavior. The aim is to intimidate rivals. The river monitor, however, is plainly not intimidated. Lowering its front ramp, a box terrapin prepares to go hunting. Just as there are left-handed and right-handed boxers, so there are southpaw crabs, as well as those who lead normally with their left. The other claw is minute by comparison and used largely for feeding. Here are two left-handers locked in battle. Here the contest is between a right and a left-hander. The tidal areas are also the home of the mud skipper, a little fish that hasn't quite made up its mind whether to live on land or in water. Every few minutes it must dip itself in water to breathe. The raised dorsal fin is a threat to rivals that insist on trespassing. The sudden appearance of the monitor reveals that mud skippers skip equally well on water.
The gray mud along the banks contains a good deal of ash from Krakatoa's 100-year-old explosion. Broken down volcanic soils have encouraged growth of almost prehistoric lushness. That prehistoric feeling is everywhere. The huge crocodiles of the Chaganta River have a special quality of menace. This monster is about to dispute territory with a rival. It's an estuarine crocodile, the fiercest and most aggressive of its kind. It's hard to imagine now that a hundred years ago, any vegetation that survived here was buried under inches and often feet of gray volcanic dust. The somber green of the regrown jungle is a perfect setting for a Javan kingfisher's jeweled wing. But there's one fish in the Jagenta River that has learned to outwit the kingfisher in an amazing way. This little fish, a relative of the gobies, swims upside down and maneuvers a leaf with its ventral fins as a portable hide. So long as it stays below the leaf, the kingfisher can't spot it. Sometimes it makes the leaf move against the current. So far, the river's many species of fish-eating birds haven't been smart enough to work this out. Before this was filmed, the leaf-hiding behavior was not known to science. It's possibly the first case on record of a tool using fish. Of course, the ruse isn't so successful against predatory fish like this spotted puffer. To discourage the puffer, the fish blows up its gills to make itself look bigger. It's a trick the puffer should understand very well. It's exactly how it defends itself against enemies. Seven species of kingfisher earn their living along the Chaganta. This one is called the rufous bat. This time a catch. The victim obviously didn't know the leaf trick.
The air is a buzz with insects and the river busy with those who feed on them, an unusual pastime for a heron. There are hungry mouths waiting for those insects which fall into the water. Some of them have very strange mouths. The needlefish's mouth is more of a flap on top of a snipe-like bill. Though they may look like a swarm of insects, in fact, these fish are feeding on a cloud of crab larvae. Now, this is an insect, and a big one, too. It's the caterpillar of the atlas moth, the largest of the silk moth family. The four-inch-long pupa of an atlas moth hangs over the river. The giant moth maturing inside will wait for night before it emerges from its four-month period of changing from the caterpillar. Against the moon, the snake's head pattern on the wingtip shows up to great effect. It's said to be a device to ward off predators. When the sun comes up, the crab larvae who escape the fish shoals emerge on the sand at the river's mouth. The atlas moth that hatched in the night is still drying its wings. At dawn, Banteng, the last descendants of the Javan wild ox, come to graze on the one open meadow at the river's mouth. Some of their ancestors, too, were spared by Krakatoa's floods. A wild pig strolled behind a Banteng cow. The bulls are almost black with white leggings. At dawn, too, the fruit bats return to roost after a night spent raiding the wild fig trees in the jungle. Their wings are three feet across. Their sharp foxy faces and red heads give them their nickname, Flying Fox. That's a female coming in to land with young at her breast. Motherhood doesn't seem to give her priority in landing rights. She has to force a rival off the branch. Life along the river wakes up. Insects are early risers. The river is a dangerous place for insects. Here you can literally be shot down, even if you're a caterpillar hanging from a thread 10 feet above the surface. The archer fish shoots drops of water at its victims, using a groove in the upper part of its mouth as a gun barrel. Pressure from the gills propels the water drops like bullets. Sometimes it attacks more directly. Big insects occasionally require a bombardment.
And finally, the perfect kill. Others exploit the archer's skill. The bigger fish is hoping to retrieve an insect before the archer fish can reach it. These are some of the wonders of Ujung Kulan, the national park which Krakatoa accidentally first created and then preserved. Ujung Kulan equally accidentally repays the debt. These Nipah fruit seeds will find their way to the mouth of the Chagenta River. In a short time, they'll reach the sea, where a prevailing southerly wind and current will greet them. And due north, 25 miles away, a new Krakatoa rises from the sea to await their arrival. In 1928, a new Krakatoa suddenly emerged from the sea, right in the center of the submarine crater left by the great explosion of 1883. Anna Krakatoa, the son of Krakatoa, is now over a thousand feet high and showing every sign of following its parents' fiery example. The entire island you're looking at now has been created by the new Krakatoa in just over 50 years. Anna Krakatoa still has a long way to go before it fills the gap left by its famous father. Anna Krakatoa is in the center. The sea area between the other two islands was the land that disappeared in the Big Bang. The map shows Krakatoa and its islands before the great eruption. The main island was over seven miles long. The eruption began in the crater Perbawitan. This is all that remained. The island, top left, increased in size due to deposits of volcanic ash. Anna Krakatoa has risen approximately where the 1883 eruption began. In the foreground is Rakata, the largest remaining piece of the old Krakatoa. The eruptions almost certainly killed all life there. So the forests are the result of a hundred years growth. How is life doing on the new Krakatoa? This barren landscape is by no means all the story. Volcanoes that emerge from the ocean are perfect laboratories in which to study how life takes a grip in apparently sterile conditions. At first come the seeds born on the wind. Their mission is to find a niche with soil in which they have at least some chance of germination in what is apparently a slag heap. For the first few years, the volcanic debris is practically sterile, and then wind, rain, and sun begin to break it down into fertile soil. The seeds that took root here are quite likely to have been a wind-borne gift from Ujung Kulan, just across the strait. The first scientist who visited Krakatoa one year after the explosion in 1884 found only one thing, a spider. Spiders, too, travel on the wind by trailing gossamer threads. This is one of several species that have already colonized Anna Krakatoa. The second route by which colonists reach newly created islands is the sea. Once again, Ujung Kulan is the nearest and most likely mainland from which these visitors set sail.
The seed pod, which we saw earlier leaving the mouth of the Chagenta River, may well have made landfall on the black volcanic sand of Anak Krakatoa's beach. The currents, as well as wind, favor such colonization for six months of the year. These pandana seeds have begun sprouting just above the tide line, a risky tactic that sometimes pays off, as this fully grown pandanus tree at the sea's edge demonstrates. Snakes are excellent swimmers, though it's probable that this python made the voyage on a drifting tree trunk. Ghost crabs, no problem about their arrival on Anna Krakatoa. The larvae drift in the plankton swarms. The water monitor is at home on land or sea. With plentiful supplies of ghost crabs, it has no food problems on arrival. Life on Anna Krakatoa is largely confined to the eastern tip. This is the only place where in 50 years vegetation has really established itself. But then it's had an uphill fight. The volcano has been erupting on and off ever since its rebirth. Lava and pumice ash continually bar further progress. Nevertheless, inside this miniature forest, there's a surprisingly varied flora including Barringtonias, Pandanus, and mature Casarina trees. On the forest floor grows a quite rich variety of mosses, grasses, ferns, and some flowering plants, like this convolvulus. Krakata, part of the original Krakatoa, is a far lusher island but then it's had twice the time for colonization and regrowth. And this hasn't been affected by constant eruptions. Nevertheless, it's a pretty good model of what Anna Krakatoa may become given time. The steep face down which the sea eagle is soaring is where the great volcano collapsed into its own seabed crater. Even here, large trees have taken root. Rakata Island fascinates scientists because it shows what nature can do from a standing start in exactly 100 years. A scientist who visited Rakata in 1920, 37 years after the great eruption, recorded 573 species of animals, from sea eagles to beetles to fruit bats. These giant fig trees give some idea of what the forest of Anna Krakatoa could become in another 50 years. Krakatoa's varied 100-year fauna includes tokay geckos. And there are land crabs for the monitor lizards to feed on. This well-fed python is probably feeding on rats. They found their way to Rakata some years ago. Whether Anna Krakatoa settles down to encourage a similar diversity of flora and fauna depends to some extent on its uncertain temperament. On now peaceful Rakata, we get a view of the Eden Anna Krakatoa could become.
Great fig trees like this 80-year-old specimen may have to wait a long time before they get their chance on the restless new volcano. Ants were one of the first insects to move in on Rakata after the big eruption. During the first phase of recolonization by grasses, they were exceedingly numerous and mostly open savanna species. With the rapid development of tropical forest, the numbers dropped and woodland species like these leaf ants predominated. The workers here are sticking the leaves together to form a nest. Here, they're using the secretions from one of their larvae as if it were a tube of glue. In 100 years, life has returned to Rakata in sufficient variety for different species to form complicated and useful relationships. These tree termite nests are a case in point. This hole wasn't made by termites, but by a far more glamorous creature. No one could call termites glamorous. They are, however, members of a marvelously organized community. These workers are exuding cement which they combine with their saliva to build up a nest as hard as concrete. The small transparent insects are the young, which emerge from the egg fully formed. Termites dispense with the larval form. All these workers are sterile females. So are the heavily armed soldiers. The sole purpose of every member is simply to service their four inch long queen, hidden deep in the center of the nest in the egg laying chamber. Termites are used to sharing their nest with other creatures. Ground nesting termites often play hosts to mongooses and snakes. With tree termites, the guest is not infrequently a bird. Many kingfishers tunnel into banks to make their nests. On Rakata, the crumbly volcanic soil is often unsuitable for tunneling. But the hard packed cement of a tree termite nest makes an excellent alternative. The collared kingfisher's young are nearly ready to fly. She's feeding them on ghost crabs. The interesting thing about the kingfisher's family is that though the visiting parent seems to have no control over which of her children begs at the nest hole, all seem to get their fair shares. No one chick has grown at the expense of the other. So there must be some system of rotation, perhaps based on the time it takes to digest the last meal. Sometimes the parents bring a golden skink, and whoever gets that to swallow isn't going to be ready for a second helping for quite some time. The skink lost its tail in the attempt to avoid capture.
The captor seems to be wondering whether to swallow the tail there and then or deliver it to its young in the nest. Even while these scenes were being filmed, Anna Krakatoa, two miles away, was once again flexing its muscles. At the end of three weeks, the young collared kingfishers are ready to leave the nest. Parental duties, however, are not over yet. A young bird perches on a lump of Krakatoa's lava, while the parent bird brings it yet another ghost crab. As for the termites, they have the nest all to themselves once more. Now it's possible to see how both sides have benefited from the association. Moving debris shows how the termites have steadily been feeding on and clearing up the droppings and scraps of food left by the young birds. While termites clear up below, ants forage on the surface. As if getting ready for the centennial, Anna Krakatoa was particularly active during the early 1980s. It was a busy time for several of Indonesia's approximately 1,000 volcanoes. In 1982, the dust from two other eruptions almost fatally stopped the engines of two Boeing 747s at over 20,000 feet. Perhaps the most eerie place from which to observe these pyrotechnics is the sea-filled center of what was once Krakatoa Island. The rocks in the foreground stand up like a jagged tooth from the broken jaw of Krakatoa's old crater. Below is the empty magma chamber into which the sea rushed to become superheated steam and into which most of Krakatoa eventually collapsed, causing the big final explosion. The reefs off Krakatoa are especially rich. Their scientific importance is that they can be dated precisely. If there's one thing that Carl Polyps detests, it's being buried in silt. Those reefs that weren't utterly destroyed by the 1883 eruption were buried under up to 90 feet of ash. Today, Krakatoa's reefs are as rich in marine life as anywhere in the tropics. The birth date of their corals is known almost to the hour.
The Indonesian authorities are anxious to extend the boundaries of the Ujung Kulon National Park to include the marine habitats around Krakatoa and its nearby islands. The tuna chase the little fish to the surface and the frigate birds home in on the small fry in feeding frenzy. Just across the Sunda Strait, Ujung Kulon luxuriates in its present security from human interference. From the air, it's easy to see how 50-foot seismic waves overran it. Let's hope it never happens again, because Ujung Kulon is the very last sanctuary of one of the rarest animals on Earth. Tracks are all that is usually seen of them. The animals have only been filmed once before and then very briefly in black and white. This is the first time they've been captured at length on color film. The jungle of Ujung Kulan is so dense that wildlife cameraman Dieter Plaga decided his only chance was along the banks of the Giganta River. Even so, it took six months before he succeeded. There were occasional tantalizing glimpses, usually when the great animal was crossing the river before disappearing into the jungle again. Then suddenly one day, Plaga was face to face with a big bull Javan rhino, one of perhaps 50 of these animals left on earth and all of them in Ujung Kulan. In this species, only the bulls have prominent horns. Nearby was a cow. The triangular plate of hide at the neck is one of the things that distinguishes the Javan from other Asian rhinos. The female suddenly moves off towards the male, who has retreated some way into the jungle. The male sprays the vegetation so the female will follow him. And there's the male again, slightly more wary this time.
settles down again, giving an opportunity for a unique close-up. He's joined by the female. Soon, she calmly starts to feed. The prehensile upper lip reaches out to seize the vegetation. Ujum Kulan had revealed its greatest mystery far more generously than Dieter Plaga could have ever hoped. The rhinos never again gave a chance like this. They simply vanished into the forest. August the 27th, 1883, was the day that shook the world and destroyed so much life and property. It was also the day that isolated and helped to preserve this remarkable wilderness area. But with the sun of Krakatoa fulminating only 25 miles away, no one can be sure of its future. Mount St. Helens, Mauna Loa, 100 miles from here on the big island of Hawaii, just two of our planet's most famous active volcanoes. Scientists have made great progress in predicting volcanic activity, but it's not yet a perfect science. Geologists classify this great volcano on Maui as dormant, not extinct. Like son of Krakatoa in Indonesia, it could erupt again. I'm George Page for Nature. Thank you. 